would you turn in your Bible with me to uh, Psalms 25? And we just want to look at verses 1 and 2. I want to really look at verse 1 and the A section, the first part of the second verse. This is what it says in the New King James Version. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. This is the word of God. Amen. Now, this is a, this is a lengthy psalm, and it's a very complicated song, psalm. This morning, I just want to talk for a few minutes about an approach to prayer. It's really David's approach to prayer. And it, it grabbed me last week, uh, this approach to prayer. And so I just want to, I want to share with you as I walk uh, through the verse, through the sections of the verse. And I don't think I'm going to keep you long today. Um, psalm 25 is, is a psalm, and scholars really uh, have problems pinpointing the exact time in David's, King David's life when he penned this poem. So we don't, we don't have an uh, exact date for it. And the, po- the, the psalm, as it turns out, it is really a prayer. It, it's one of the prayer psalms. Uh, what we do believe was happening in David's life is that there were some adversaries, there were some enemies that were uh, present in his life. And so he turns to God in prayer, as we do. People who know God turn to God in prayer. And so this, this, this message today, this, this, this approach to prayer, it reminds us uh, that we have the blessed privilege, not only of fellowshipping and friendship with God, but we can take him our problems when we know how to approach him. Y'all know approaching is uh, important in any relationship, right? You, you, you not God, and you don't want people approaching you any old kind of way, right? So the approach is critical, and that's what gripped me in this psalm today, that we can approach God the Father in confidence, and we want to use this psalm to lift up a lesson that we can learn. Listen to what Psalms, the psalmist says. This is David. He says, to you, O Lord. I lift my soul. So let's look at this in three parts. To you, because because this, 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 this psalm, the structure of it is acronistic, acronistic, which means that with each verse, the the writer uses the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it, it is a carefully worded song. The wording is intentional, which means when we approach this psalm, we have to be sensitive to all of the wording in a more specific way. And so when he opens the psalm and he says, to you, we have to stop, we have to pause right there to consider what he means by this word. And the word in the Greek is, and the word in the Hebrew alphabet, the word in the Hebrew is, is El, and it is to you. It really, the word really means to turn to. It means moving toward. So when the, when the psalmist says to you, what he is indicating is that he is now moving toward. He is turning to some specific, some particular thing or some particular person. Now, we know in the Hebrew culture, in the time of David, the Ark of the Covenant, David, you know, carried around the Ark of the Covenant. As a matter of fact, David took the Ark of the Covenant and put it in Jerusalem. He did that. He put the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. And when our ancient Hebrew forefathers would pray, they would turn toward the Ark of the Covenant. You remember when Solomon dedicated the temple, God says, when you pray, turn toward the east. And today, Jews still turn toward the east when they're praying. And so in the text, when, when, when the writer King David says, to you, 
he's indicating that he's turning toward something. And that something that he's turning toward in order to have his prayer heard is the Ark of the Covenant. You see, and the Ark of the Covenant, you already know, was a, was a box that was designed by God. And inside it, there were some particular items. But on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, there was the mercy seat. Y'all remember that? On top of it, there were two cherub who faced each other with their wings outstretched. And in the middle of that was the mercy seat. That was the throne of God. That was thought to be the presence of God. And so when David says to you, we have to pause because he wants to identify the one that he is turning to. He's turning to you. Amen. He's, turn, he's turning toward, and uh, he's turning toward something. Now, now, the significance is, the question is, what are you turning toward in times of need? You see, what are you turning toward in times of need? Because whatever you turn toward, that is an idol. That's a God with a small g. If it's not Yah, if it's not Yahweh, if it's not God, then whatever you are turning toward to have a need in your life met is a God with a small g. Amen. And idols are still worthless. Idols, idols, they, idol, and what is an idol? Okay, here, here's what an idol is. An idol is anything that disproportionately consumes your thought, affections, actions, or resources away from God. It is anything that takes your focus and trust off of God. For example, your job, your career was an idol until it let you down. You see, idols will let you down. They will let you down no matter what it is. An idol is empty, it's shallow, it offers a promise that it cannot keep. An idol, an idol can't stand up under pressure. Uh, that's, why, that's why people in high places who lean on their popularity, who lean on their resources, who lean on their skills when all of that stuff doesn't meet the need in their life, when all of that stuff doesn't make a difference on their inner life, they try to kill themselves. Idols will disappoint you. I don't care what it is. If it's your family, if it's your spouse, if it's your significant other, if it's a relationship, anything that you put above God will let you down. It will let you down. You think you're smart now? You got a, 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 a diploma from MIT and Harvard hanging on your wall? That's fine. But that will let you down. An idol is anything that will let you down. It will disappoint you. But like David, most of us here have experienced God. And we know that God won't let you down. You know, we might periodically turn to something else. And then when that fails, we coming back home, aren't we? We coming back to the God who we know won't let us down. Amen. Because we've experienced God and you know that God has what you need and what you need is not always material things. We need things that God can give like peace and wisdom and commitment and hope and joy and patience and vision and strength. You got to turn to God for those kinds of things. And in the, the prayer here, David says, I know who I'm turning to, to you. Amen. Amen. That, 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 that phrase, L, that to you uh, is literal, and uh, it, it suggests relationship with God, doesn't it? To you. You know, Jesus, Jesus taught the disciples to pray. He said, when you pray, say, our Father. And in that approach to God, we turn to our Father. That's personal. There's intimacy there. It's, it's private. It, it's the one who we can turn to, the one who can do for us what no one else can do. I'm so glad I'm a Christian. You know, I'm a, I'm a biblical Christian. I'm not the Christianity that's defined by American pop culture. I, I don't know what that is. And whatever that is, it make me want to be the opposite of that. 
but I'm a biblical Christian, and I'm so glad I'm a biblical Christian. I'm so glad that Jesus is my Savior. I'm so glad that he transformed my life. I'm so glad that I have a personal relationship with him. I, I'm, I'm so glad that when all else fails, I have someone who can hold me in the palm of his hand. Man, y'all, you know what? If you're listening today and you don't know him like that, you can. Just confess him. You got to confess him with your mouth. You got to repent of your sins and turn to him. Give him your life and he will make the difference. Have I got a witness? He will make the difference in your life. I don't care what your friends say. I don't care what your co-workers think. I don't care what your family say. Jesus is all the world. He can make all a world of difference in your life. To you. So he says, to you. And then he names God, O oh Lord. Y'all see that in the text? To you, O oh Lord. Now, the name Lord, really, the name, the name Lord, the name, the reason we see the name Lord, which is translated in the Hebrew, uh, Yahweh, and you know, you know the name of God, Yahweh. Let me say a little something about that, okay, since I'm in a teaching mode this morning. Let me say a little something about that. So God disclosed, he revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush on the backside of the desert. Y'all remember that? I'm going to say something else about that in a minute. And God, Moses said, what's your name? And he said, tell them I am. He, he said, I am that I am. Yeah. Right? So the name Yahweh was so sacred to our ancient Hebrew ancestors that they would not mention his name. Because to mention his name is to bring his presence. And so they would use in writing what is called a tetragrammaton. Y-H, you've probably seen it before, Y-H-W-H, I think it is. And it stands in the place for Yahweh. But the ancient Hebrews, they wouldn't call God by his proper name, so they would call him Adonai. And the name Adonai means the Lord. And so when David says in this, to you, O Yahweh, what he's really talking about is a personal relationship with God that was initiated by God. Because God had to make his presence known in that fire on the backside of the desert. And when Moses went to see the fire, he was amazed because the bush burned but was not consumed. And God spoke to him in a personal way out of the flames of that fire. It's an indication of a personal relationship with God. David is using the title that suggests personal relationship. Now, it's, now the wonderful thing is about this is that uh, it is a disclosure of Jesus because in, in, in the gospel according to Luke in chapter 24, y'all might remember near the end of the chapter, this was on the road to Emmaus. You might remember, remember when Jesus was uh, resurrected, he was on the road to Emmaus and then he disclosed himself and then he went back to Jerusalem and he said something about the word. He said, he said uh, the word of God, he said, you know, the problem with y'all is you miss me in the word of God. He said the prophets of the Old Testament and the law and the Psalms, they all speak of me. And so when we read the Psalms, we have to look for Jesus. And we can look for Jesus in the words, O oh Lord, because that word Yahweh suggests personal relationship. And so for Jesus, Jesus helps us to understand that, that, that I am, that I am descended, came and dwelt among men so that you and I can have a personal relationship. And that what we need is not just material, what we need is material and spiritual. And so Jesus says seven I am in the book of John to help us to understand that whatever we need when we are in relationship with him, he has that and more. I am, he says, the bread of life. Any man who comes to me will never hunger again. I am the light of the world. He said, he who follows me will not be in darkness. I am 
the door, he says, if any man enters into me, he will be saved. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I am the true vine. Unless you're connected to me, you will have an unfruitful life. There's personal relationship, y'all. Listen, listen. When we go to God, we, to you, I've identified, I've identified you as my God, O oh Lord. And then listen to what he says. I will lift up my soul. Now, that's incredible. That's incredible. So a little, little background. So the Greeks, they would separate the human body between body, they, between um, mind and soul. Mind and soul. So they had uh, 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 a twofold way of looking at the body, but the Hebrews never did. They had a singular. So when you look at the word soul for, for in the Hebrew, it, doesn't, it means the entire you, the complete human being, y'all see? And so it, so, so it says, to you, O Yahweh, I lift up my soul. So, you know, to lift up means to honor God. In the context, it means, it means uh, it's in deference to respect and honor. The psalmist is saying he looks up to God, respects God. He honors God with his whole life, with his very life. And coming before God, you and I before in prayer, we come with all that we are. We come with all that we are. We come, you, if you want to approach God, you got to come openly. You got to come honestly with all of our faults and all of our failures, with all of our flaws and with our fallenness. We come before God. It means that when we come before God, you can't come proud. You've got to come humbly before God because God is holy and he does not tolerate nonsense or sin. So when you come before God, you need to understand that you are going before a holy God and that you are all messed up. Amen. You're flawed. You're flaky. You're sometimey. You, you are, you, you, you're, just, you're, just, you're just messed up. And when we come before God, we can't come self with a self-righteous attitude. We can't come with pride or a false sense of self. And you know, I know you think a lot of yourself, and you ought to have good self-esteem, but when you come into the presence of God, you need to understand exactly who you are, and what exactly who you are is a person who has been made to be new. You have no righteousness of your own. You can't come before God because of your virtue. I don't care how high you hold your head when you walk down the aisles of the church. You come before God humbly. Amen. God knows what you're made of. Hey, yes, he does. He knows your thoughts. He knows your intents. He, he know, you know what I'm saying? You know, we, we look at ourselves and we compare peop ourselves to other people. And, you know, I, wouldn't, I sure wouldn't do that. That sure was wrong. But you know what? The same thing that you are criticizing in somebody else is in you. You don't, we don't need to point fingers at anybody. Because the same thing we're gossiping about what somebody else did, that same thing is in you. We come not out of pride, not as one who, uh, we come as one who has been made righteous. The song says, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless we stand before the throne. All right? So, Jesus told a parable, didn't he? About Y'all remember the parable about the, the, the Pharisee and the publican? Jesus says, uh, a Pharisee and a publican went up to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee, of course, you know, is a religious individual, the hierarchy of the religious order in Israel. They wore the robes and all of that. He stood up to pray, and he said, God, I thank you I'm not like other people. Robbers, extortioners, adulterers. I thank you, or even like this publican. I'm not like them. I fast twice a week. 
and I pay a tenth of all that I earn. And Jesus says, the publican was there. He was on his knees with his face to the ground. He would not even look toward the temple. He was facing it, but he would not look up. Instead, he smote his breast. He beat his breast and said, Lord, Lord, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Jesus said, that one went home more justified than the other. Y'all get that? Justified before God. I lift up my soul. You and I can lift up our souls before God because we have been justified only by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can lift up our souls. So here's a word picture for you. When you lift up your soul to God, you better lift that soul up through the blood of Jesus Christ so that Jesus' blood can cover it before you get into the presence of God. Then you can come boldly to the throne of God and make your request known unto God. You can come boldly to the throne of God where you can receive mercy in your time of need. I will lift my soul to God. I like that. Y'all like that? Hebrews chapter 4, 16, seeing that we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace where we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Amen. I'm moving through. I'm almost finished. To you, O Yahweh, I lift up my soul. And then he says, O my God, I trust in you. Now notice here, notice here, in the first phrase, he uses the, the, the name Yahweh. But in the second phrase, oh my God, you see Lord in the first, God in the second. This is the name that is you, this is, this is Elohim, you see. This is, this is the name that God gives in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, right? This is Elohim, right? This is, this is the creator God. This is the God who created the heavens and the earth. This is the God who separated the firmament from the heavens. This is the one who set the sun, moon, and stars on their course, who called forth the mountains, scooped out the oceans, and made every living creature. This is Elohim. This is the God who created man in the image, in, in, after his image and after his likeness, who made man the crown of creation and who breathed in man the breath of life and he became a living soul and he made man for relationship for himself. This is the omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God. And this is what he says, oh my God, you are trustworthy. Y'all get that? You, you, you want to trust somebody that's able. Is that right? Don't you want to trust somebody? You can't trust somebody that's not able. If you're going to trust somebody, you want to trust in God. This, 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 is, this Hebrew word for, for trust, it means to feel secure. It means to have confidence in its relationship with God. And it, it, it's, it's, it's circular, y'all, you know, because people trust God and God vindicates your trust. Yes. He's been faithful to you. You know he's been faithful, and so you trust him more. When you trust in God, he vindicates that trust. He comes through every time. Have I got a witness in here? Does God come through every time? No, 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 no. I want to know for real. No, I, now, don't, don't, don't fool me now. Don't fool me now. If you're not by yourself, if you're with somebody else, just turn to him and say, God has come through every time. He comes through every time. Every time I need him, he comes through. Every time I call on him, he comes through. He's the God you can trust in. Amen. And the more I trust him, the more I want to trust him. The more I trust him, the more I realize that I can trust him. I don't know about you, but I've learned to trust in God. I've learned to lean on him, y'all. We need to lean on him. As you make your way through the day, you need to lean on him. You have a divine support system in Jesus Christ, and he will never fail. I don't care how hard you lean on him. He will never collapse under the weight 
weight. You can put your weight on him. Have I got a witness up in here? You can put your weight on Jesus. You can cast your cares on him, for he cares for you. So whatever burden you are carrying this morning, I want you to be able to approach God like David approached God in this text to you. Oh, Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh, Elohim, I trust in you. I will trust you with my life. Come to God with confidence, knowing that he's good all the time and that he is for you. Come with confidence, knowing that God has everything you need and that you have been justified and that you have a friend in Jesus. Amen. Amen. That approach. Oh, Lord. Let's say, to you, oh, Lord, I lift up my soul. In you, my God, I have trusted. Amen.